much for inviting me to speak today. It's really fantastic to come and talk to you about sleep, my favourite topic, and I'm sure it's very close to your heart as well. Um, I've actually been in uh, Papua New Guinea this week uh, working on a mine site with some shift workers around their fatigue, and um, it's part of the reason why I have this display of, of different pictures on my title slide, because really it shows that there are lots of different occupations where sleep's very important but also, obviously, personally, to us and our health, it's very, very important as well. Um, now, I always like to start by saying that this is one of those rare occasions where if you do happen to fall asleep while I'm talking, I don't mind. <laughs> Naps are very, very important. And so if you feel you need to take a little power nap during my talk, it's absolutely fine. It's not rude at all. Um, and the other thing I like to start with is just to find out who had less than six hours sleep last night. Pop your hand up. Mm. It's very, very common, and as you get older, your sleep changes, and that's one of the things I'm going to be going through today, talk about some of the normal changes that occur as you age and how some of those things are related to health and some not. Um, and uh, as you might imagine, with my travelling to Papua New Guinea this week, I haven't had much sleep either, so we're kind of all in the same boat. Um, but we always, we always recommend that when you can, you try and get some more and not worry about it too much when you don't. Okay. So as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about how um, sleep changes over the lifespan today. And there are quite significant changes. Um, you might think that it's really just to do with babies to sort of adulthood, but there are changes that occur over adulthood into older life as well. And one of the questions that I often get asked is about do we need less sleep as we get older? And it's a very, very interesting and kind of controversial question in the sleep field. Um, some people believe that you, you don't need as much sleep as you get older, and some people believe that you do. Um, I think your sleep just changes, and what you do then during your day then changes. And some people nap a little bit more during the day, and that maybe changes how much sleep they get at night. So I think it's all part of a natural change and ageing process. Um, we'll talk a little bit about sleep problems that occur as you get older and also about how uh, sleep is involved with um, overall health, medical conditions, and of course I'll be talking today about um, diabetes. And then I'll end with some good news about how we can actually get better sleep. So we'll take away some practical tips. So as I've said, sleep is essential for your wellbeing, and you've probably heard a lot about it. Um, you might have heard some about it this week because it's actually Sleep Awareness Week. Um, in Australia, and we've had a number of campaigns around um, how to get more improved sleep. So if you've been on social media, you might have, have seen that or seen some stories in the news. Um, but really, good sleep means that we're able to perform at our optimal level. So we're able to think well, we're able to engage fully in life and be safe. And so that's what I do when I go into workplaces, is about looking at how good sleep leads to better and safer practices. So I'm just going to do a little bit of biology here, just so you can learn about what happens in the brain uh, when we sleep. So sleep is really controlled by an internal clock that we have in our brain, and it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. There's a big word for you. If you're ever doing um, Scrabble or something, put that one down, you get a lot of points. Um, we shorten it to SCN. So it's a clock that's in your brain, and it's very, very sensitive to light. Light is the thing that entrains your internal body clock. There are some other things as well, your meals and things can help, but light is the main thing. So if you ever have travelled across time zones and gone to another country, it's the light in the new place that will help entrain your internal body clock to that new time zone. And this clock, it basically helps regulate over the day, over a 24-hour period, when you feel sleepy and when you feel alert. Um, and it can then also be moved slightly, as I was suggesting, with the light with jet lag, but on a daily basis. So you might have heard about in the news, for example, the, the concern that adolescents are using screens too much, their phones and their computers and that thing, kind of thing at night. A lot of bright light at night will help move your clock in later into the evening, and a lot of bright light in the morning helps move it back the other way. So you might find that 
the more you get up early in the morning, the more you find that you're waking up at those same times always and that you're very, very sleepy in the evening. This often happens as you get older. It's part of a natural change. But also that bright light in the morning is helping entrain your clock to get up early. So one of the things you can do if you want to make sure you uh, sleep a little bit later in the morning is get bright light in the evening. Or if you're trying to help an adolescent get up for school, make sure they don't have too much bright light in the evening and actually give it to them in the morning instead. And so uh, our circadian rhythm or our blood body clock actually helps regulate our hormones, um, our activity and body temperature as well. And it's also very closely linked to a hormone called melatonin that you might have all heard of. Um, and it, that can be used in conjunction with bright light to help move your circadian rhythm. So this internal clock is very important because when you're younger, you tend to have a slightly longer um, oh, and more sensitivity to the light. So it's a slightly longer clock span. And you also tend to have, um, you're more sensitive to light, as I said. So that's why the adolescents tend to get very um, late in their sleep. But we can use it as you get older as well to help you um, stay more alert through the evening. So when we do actually fall asleep, our, we don't just have one kind of sleep the whole way through our sleep period. Now this uh, schematic actually is sort of a cartoon of what the sleep might look like for a typical person. Now we know a typical person never really exists, but I'll take you through this so you can see what someone's sleep might look like. Um, it's broken up into different stages, and so you can see down the y-axis there, or down the side, we've got stages, one, two, three, four. One is a lighter stage of sleep, and as you go further down into stage four, sleep gets deeper. And what that means is that all your systems relax, they're shutting down, um, all the things like your heart rate drops, your temperature drops, your kidneys reduce in, in function so you're not producing urine, um, and everything just is calm and relaxed, your breathing is relaxed. Um, but in your lighter stages of sleep, so stage one sleep, it's closer to being awake. So you tend to then be able to hear noises and sounds more readily. When you're deep, deep asleep, it takes a long time to wake you up. And you've probably all experienced holding a baby that is really deeply asleep and they're so floppy and you can't even wake them up. That's that deep, deep sleep. And then you go out of this deep sleep into another stage called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And that's when you tend to have a lot of dreaming activity. And people think that you're very deeply asleep during this stage, and actually you're not. Your brain activity is very similar to wake. It's almost like you're just, just asleep. It's just that your brain's very active with dreaming, and so that you, so that you don't act out those dreams, um, your body holds you paralysed. So you're, it's a very active stage of sleep versus a fairly non-active stage of sleep, uh, which is the deep sleep. And you cycle between these over the day. Uh, sorry, over the night. Sorry, I've been talking to shift workers all week, so I've been talking about their daytime sleep. So you over the night. And um, people might typically get um, several REM periods and deep sleep periods, and these roughly last around 90 minutes. So you'll enter into the stage one, go through a deep sleep, have a REM period, and then come back up into light sleep again. And what tends to happen, this schematic doesn't show it really very clearly, but you tend to come, um, most people come right up and will have very light stage of sleep after their REM period. And that's where you might hear something, you might roll over, um, and some people worry about being awake at night during those times. And the best thing really is to just sort of relax and try and not, go, uh, not to worry about it. Those periods do become a little longer as you get older. So those periods of wakefulness through sleep become a little more um, common. This is a schematic to show the amount of wake versus that non-REM or deep sleep. And REM sleep changes over our lifespan. So when we're a baby, we tend to have lots and lots of uh, deep sleep and REM sleep, really almost as much as uh, we're awake. Um, and then during our 
early adult years, we tend to have more non-REM or deep sleep. We tend to be awake for longer. We have non, more non-REM, REM sleep, and then that smaller portion of REM. It's interesting that when in very young children, they have quite a lot of that dreaming sleep. And they believe that that's because the brains are developing and that dr the dreaming sleep is very important for memory formation and brain development. And then as you get older, we see that the wakefulness period remains the same. Um, the amount of REM sleep is just a little bit less. And our non-REM sleep is very similar but slightly more fractured in the sense that you wake up a little more through that period of time. Now, sleep efficiency is really a measure we have of the amount of sleep you get during a period of time that you're in bed. So, for example, a baby, if you're very lucky, will sleep through a whole period of time that they're in bed, and so they'll have a very high sleep efficiency. Um, but if you wake up a lot, and so you're awake less, your sleep efficiency is lower. Um, and so what we see is that over the uh, lifespan, that this, ch this sleep efficiency changes. So when we're very young, we have very high sleep efficiency. We're using the amount of time we're in bed uh, very efficiently for sleep. And as we get older, it drops a little bit. But it's not devastatingly uh, bad. You know, a lot of people think that their sleep has changed tremendously over their lifespan. They really wish that they could go to bed and be comatose for eight hours. Um, and that's just actually a fallacy. That's not what sleep is like at all. There are these natural periods of deep sleep and wakefulness. But sleep has changed over recent years. And so this is some data from the American Sleep Foundation. Um, I'm hoping you can see the numbers. Um, but essentially, the, the take-home message from this slide is that those people getting less than six hours sleep has increased since the 90s. And so what we're seeing is that our very busy 24-7 kinds of lives and the fact that we've got these um, tablets and uh, you know, phones and that kind of thing that emit bright light and we're using them a lot in the evening in the bedroom. Please take them out of the bedroom. Um, all of those things are impacting on our sleep. And so what we're getting is a gradual increase in the number of people who are sleeping less. And that's very, very important because shorter amounts of sleep can have implications for um, conditions such as diabetes, which we'll talk about in a moment. The other thing that does happen as you age is that the um, likelihood of you developing a sleep disorder, such as sleep apnea or insomnia, can increase. And so what we see is from kind of... Um, uh, from uh, 55 through to uh, 85, these are some um, data um, from a, again from the American Sleep Foundation, we see that these common sleep disorders, insomnia, just general snoring, sleep apnea, and restless leg syndrome, where you get that creepy feeling in your legs that you just want to keep moving them. Sometimes it's in your arm as well, and you, can just want, you just have to kind of, what you feel like you want to keep moving them, and that can disrupt your sleep. They do increase uh, over time um, in the, uh, a, as you age. So things like insomnia can um, increase. We see that um, general snoring tends to become more um, sleep apnea and that the restless legs can increase as well. And so these sleep disorders can then increase your risk for um, uh, metabolic disruption or other kinds of uh, uh, chronic diseases because really your sleep is being fragmented and not, you know, you're not getting as good sleep as what you, um, your body needs. So sleep apnea, so general snoring, I should probably start by saying, is just really where you've got a bit of a floppy airway that makes lots of noise when you breathe in and out at night, and particularly when you're lying on the back, on your back. So I'm sure you've probably all experienced somebody, you know, lying on their back, making a racket, and then if you nudge them and they roll over, it doesn't, um, it's, they're not as noisy anymore. And that's really because gravity is pushing down on their airway. They've got some um, floppy uh, tissue there. And of course, your muscles, as you get older, aren't what they used to be when you were younger. And that happens in your throat and your airway as well. And they become a little more floppy. And that's what all the noise is. Sleep apnea is actually where the airway closes over periodically. So your airway um, collapses 
Um, and then you need to wake up just a little bit for the, the muscles to get tone again and for you to be able to breathe. And this all happens to the person with sleep apnea without them really knowing, but it can be really scary for the person lying next to them because they're waiting for them to breathe. Um, and this can happen many, 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 many times throughout the night and, and it can affect the um, oxygen saturation in your blood. And of course, because you're not getting a good sleep, um, your uh, body is being very activated and so your cardiovascular system is being um, uh, stressed, um, your heart is being stressed by all of this and of course you've got a very disrupted sleep. So during the day, sleep apnea can lead to, um, can be a risk factor for, for cardiovascular disease and metabolic diseases such as um, diabetes. There are a lot of treatments available and really CPAP continuous positive airway pressure, where you wear the mask like that lady is wearing there. Um, uh, there's ones that just go over your nose and ones that are over your nose and your mouth. And that uh, blows airway, uh, air into your airway at pressure and just basically keeps it open. Um, it was a pretty amazing invention. It was uh, done by an Australian, of course. And so now it's used worldwide as the gold standard treatment. Uh, there are also other devices like mandibular advancement splints, which is a mouth guard, which basically just brings your bottom jaw forward just a fraction, and that helps keep that airway open. And of course, weight reduction. You've probably heard your uh, doctors talking about this as well, if, if you know anybody with sleep apnea. Really what happens is if you put on weight around your tummy and you're lying on your back, that extra weight pressure can affect your breathing when you sleep. So reducing weight around the middle is very, very, um, also very helpful for reducing sleep apnea. Insomnia as well is really the, the most common sleep disorder, something that people describe. Sometimes they get it um, just uh, a, a little bit after perhaps something that's happened in life or to do with work, and sometimes it becomes chronic. And both of these uh, this disorder really is something that can then be um, associated with other kinds of conditions such as depression or anxiety. And often when a sleep psychologist is trying to treat it, they're looking at all of those effects together and how to, how to solve and resolve some of those issues for you. And also uh, develop ways that you can um, feel more comfortable about your sleep or help you relearn almost how to go to sleep. So there are some quite effective treatments. But really, insomnia is characterised by difficulty falling asleep, feeling like you're waking a lot during the night, or waking too early, waking unrefreshed. And then there are some next day consequences. You often feel quite fatigued, not necessarily sleepy, but quite fatigued. Um, as I said before, treatments really revolve around healthy sleep habits. So if looking at your sleep hygiene, we would refer to it, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, behavioural therapies, um, things like uh, bed restriction, so basically only allowing you to go to bed for a certain period of time while you build up a sleep pressure over multiple nights, and then you're almost relearning how to go back to sleep. Um, there are some prescription medications that some doctors would prescribe, but we really would think that to, to stay away from those and to use more of the sort of cognitive behavioural therapies that a, a sleep psychologist would use. And also sometimes melatonin can be quite effective in helping you get off to sleep as well. <clears throat> so other contributors to sleep problems. We talked a little bit about ageing um, and, and overweight. So if you're overweight, you tend to be more likely to uh, develop sleep apnea. Other things like pain and illness, of course, can disrupt your sleep. So if you have arthritis or osteoporosis or one of those things when lying in bed can actually be quite uncomfortable or disrupt your sleep. Um, a lot of digestive disorders are overlooked as something that can affect your sleep, but if, uh, if you've ever had a very large meal before going to bed, you'll understand how people who have some digestive complaints can feel heartburn and some of those issues very much can affect your ability to sleep and will wake you up through the night. So actually one of the things we recommend is if you have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, to not eat too close to bedtime so you don't have a full stomach that stomach is not pressing up into your um, um, uh, 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 digestive tract, and so then you're able to get a more, uh, more restful sleep. You're not being disturbed by feeling uncomfortable. 
Some medications do uh, affect your sleep and also stress, obviously, is something that really heavily plays into feelings of insomnia. Um, and if you do lead a very stressful life, some people find that things like meditation uh, before bed can be very, very helpful in helping them get off to sleep. So turning now, looking at poor sleep specifically in diabetes. So as, as I've said before, really one of the main contributors or one of the real links between diabetes and, and sleep is around sleep disorders such as sleep apnea. And that's really because of the weight gain um, being one of the primary risk factors for type 2 diabetes and also sleep apnea. And then the fact that the uh, sleep apnea itself is a disorder that really increases whole body inflammation in the sense that your whole body is affected by this sleep disorder, which then can tie into um, metabolism. Um, we see that both high and low blood glucose can affect our sleep, and that's really because your body is sensing these changes and, um, and disrupting your sleep, waking you up. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned before, heartburn and chronic pain, which are really associated with diabetes, can also really affect sleep and just lead to that general disruption. <clears throat> we see in population studies, so these big, big studies where they ask people things like, how many hours of sleep did you get or how many hours of sleep do you get regularly and do you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, we see that there's a real link there. So the less sleep you get, the more likely it is that you um, could develop uh, type 2 diabetes. And really it's around, I'll show you some data in a moment, but really it's around the fact that um, your body is not metabolising glucose as effectively anymore when you're very, very sleep deprived and your um, circulating glucose stays high in your system leading to um, uh, a type 2 diabetes. We see also in laboratory studies, and these are some of the things that I conduct at the University of South Australia, where we bring people into the lab and um, keep them there for a week or two weeks and put them on different sleep schedules, sometimes taking sleep away, so just um, basically chronically sleep restricting them over many, many days, maybe only giving them four or five hours sleep a night. Or sometimes we put them on a shift work schedule, so making them sleep during um, the day and be awake at night to see how these different sleep schedules affect performance and health. And you might think that sounds kind of crazy that we have people come and live in the lab. Um, they stay there for, for many days and we control the light and the temperature so that we can really get an idea of how sleep is affecting these aspects of people's lives. The good thing is, is that we see is that even though um, glucose metabolism is impaired by short sleep um, in these otherwise healthy individuals, when we give them good sleep again, it's reversed. So really it seems to be happening during the period of time when they're getting um, this short sleep. And so this is data, it's the only data slide I'm going to show you, so don't worry. It's, it's really just uh, results from continuous glucose monitors that we use in the lab. And these are a little sensor that sit under the skin and sense glucose um, in the fluid just under your skin at periods throughout the whole day. And so what we see here is um, in the blue line, the continuous uh, glucose data from somebody that got four hours sleep every night for five nights. And the orange line is when they got 10 hours sleep at the beginning of the study. So we brought them into the lab. They had a couple of nights of 10 hours time in bed for sleep. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? 10 hours time in bed. Um, and, they, and they slept a lot of that. And then we put them on this sleep restriction uh, condition where they only got four hours sleep for five nights. And then we monitored their, their glucose on each of these days. And so what we see is that um, the grey boxes are the 10 and the four hour sleeps. And that in the condition where they're up all night and they only get the four hours sleep, we see glucose stays very, very high in their system, even though they were only having a breakfast, lunch and dinner during the day. And so their glucose is kind of going all crazy at night, trying to keep their body active and awake, and it's elevated. And this is what we see time and time again with these studies, is that glucose stays very high 
in the, in the bloodstream um, when people are sleep deprived. And then what also happens is their response to meals isn't as good as what it should be when they get good sleep. So it's a lot harder to control your diabetes when you're not getting as good sleep or if you have a sleep disorder. The good news is, is when you have that good sleep, when you go back to having the good sleep, your ability to control glucose and your glucose metabolism um, improves. So overall, um, there's a, a range of general health issues that are associated with sleep. And you've probably all heard a lot about drowsy driving as one of the major performance effects and things that you should be concerned about when not getting good sleep. And we see this a lot with poor shift workers who are having to drive home after a, a long shift overnight. And then at eight o'clock in the morning, they're, they're on the road and having to drive and very, very tired. And this can um, contribute to them having an accident or increasing the risk of them having an accident. So one of the other things I was saying before was about cardiovascular disease and, and sleep disorders. But short sleep really can um, lead to an increased risk of high blood pressure and can also lead to an increased risk over time uh, for heart attacks and stroke. And these, again, are studies that sort of ask people how much sleep you get and then um, find out their increased risk for these particular um, events and disorders. Uh, and then when we bring people into the lab, we can see that even in a short term, that things like their blood pressure can change with short sleep. We see that hormones change, um, and things like obesity and weight management become more difficult with short sleep. Um, and that also there's this increase in stress hormones. It's very interesting, this reciprocal relationship. So being more stressed leads to short sleep, and then short sleep leads to a higher amount of things like cortisol in your system. It doesn't have that natural drop off in the afternoon that it should, it stays elevated and that can really affect your health. And we're beginning to realise more and more and more that mental health, um, distress, irritability and depression are all associated with short and disrupted sleep as well. Um, and you probably know, and what, well, either from personal experience, that, that alcohol and caffeine can affect your sleep. So obviously if you have too much caffeine too close to bedtime, really hard to fall asleep or you get a very disrupted sleep. Um, and if you have too much alcohol, it can make you feel very sleepy. It can be very effective in putting you to sleep, um, but it gives you a very bad um, rest of your sleep. So it helps you get off to sleep, but then while the alcohol is being metabolised in your system, it affects your temperature um, and you're not able to get that lovely deep sleep um, that, you, that you should. And it also wakes you up early. Um, and also things like nicotine, because it's a stimulant, can also affect your ability to fall asleep. So all of these things avoid close to bedtime, which really leads into my practical tips for a good sleep. And this is really about establishing good sleep hygiene and consistency around your sleep. Um, a lot of people don't have a very consistent bedtime or wake time, and these things can also affect uh, your ability to get a good sleep it's actually really important to have a consistent wake time. Um, and a lot of uh, young people think that they can catch up on sleep by sleeping in. Um, and this is actually very counterproductive because, of course, then that night they don't feel as tired, they stay up later, and then they want to sleep ev in even more. So it's really important to keep waking up at the same time and establish that regular sleep schedule. Maintain a relaxing bedtime routine. So we often tell new parents who just had a baby um, to establish a bedtime routine with them. You know, give them a bath, have a bottle, have a relaxing story, those sorts of things to help them understand and signal it's bedtime. And then we forget about doing it for ourselves. We should be doing it for ourselves too. So have a nice relaxing shower or bath. Um, in actual fact, a very warm shower or bath will help you fall asleep because it increases your body temperature and then a uh, half an hour or so later, your temperature will drop. It'll, it'll naturally drop because of course, you've, you're trying to regulate your temperature and that's what you need to get off to sleep. You actually need your body temperature to drop slightly to get off to sleep. And so it's very, very important to think about temperature in your bedroom as well. So you want a nice, cool, dark, quiet 
cave, really, to sleep. Um, and that's really the most effective place uh, to sleep. It's, it's good during winter because we've got these cold nights. You can rug up and get nice and warm. Harder in summer to make sure you have that cool environment to sleep. Don't have too many liquids close to bedtime, particularly caffeine and those kinds of things. And don't um, eat too close to bedtime. Certainly don't have a big curry half an hour before going to bed. You're going to suffer. I'll tell you that now. Um, and if you're particularly sensitive to caffeine, really stop it at lunchtime. You'll know whether you're someone that shouldn't have too much caffeine through the afternoon. Um, and things like alcohol as well, just not too much with dinner. Exercise, of course, is really good to help um, control stress, but just don't do it too close to bedtime, otherwise you'll be all activated and awake and wanting to stay up. So something, if you want to do something just uh, quiet before bedtime, some yoga or some meditation is very helpful. So in summary, we see that there are sleep changes um, during the night that, that do uh, uh, increase with age. We have a little bit less deep sleep, a little bit more lighter sleep. Um, we have a difficulty maintaining sleep due to those sort of arousing awakenings, but that's all normal and fine. Um, the internal biological clock does shift to an earlier uh, bedtime and wait time, and, th and that is also normal, but if you are getting annoyed with falling asleep at 8 o'clock at night, if you have a bit of bright light, it'll help shift your bedtime a little bit later. And certainly older people experience a higher prevalence of sleep disorders, so you, if you are thinking that you might suffer from snoring or insomnia, please do go and see your uh, GP, who will be able to refer you to a sleep physician or a sleep psychologist, and they can help you out. There really are a lot of people now who are very well trained in sleep who can help you. Particularly here in Adelaide, we have an excellent um, a lot of sleep doctors um, here in Adelaide. And I just always like to end with this, and in actual fact, uh, I hope you can see it along the bottom. I'll, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit so you can see it, because it was a podcast uh, that I did with this uh, really fantastic historian called Roger Ertrich. He's a professor of history. Um, and what he did is a few years ago, he wrote a book about kind of how we used to sleep um, a couple of hundred years ago. And basically he pulled together all these great sources from various different literary places and, and um, stories. And what he found is that we would often sleep in two parts. We would have a first sleep and a second sleep. And that this was completely normal, that people would get up in the middle of the night. They might go to sleep at 8 o'clock, sleep through to 11, something like that. And then from 11 till 2, kind of wander around, do things. Um, they might meet their neighbours. Uh, they might engage in some pleasant um, behaviours with their bed partner. Uh, they might read a book or paint or do something like this. And so it, they found that people, because we, they didn't have electric lights, people went to bed quite a bit earlier and used the whole night. So they would uh, uh, have kind of these two sleeps, which was completely normal. And our discussion on this podcast is great because we, I sort of talked about it from a biological perspective and he talked about it from a history perspective and we really came to the same conclusion that sleep behaviours are quite individual um, and what we've done in modern times is try and squish sleep into this one corner of our lives instead of realising that it's quite normal to wake up in the middle of the night, we don't have to lie comatose for eight hours. Um, and that in actual fact, there are many ways that we can sleep and make up for lost sleep during the day with things like naps, which I'm a great advocate for. So um, that's the uh, podcast there in the, in the sleep uh, review mag. Um, we just did that earlier this year. And so now I'm quite happy to answer any questions um, about your sleep and um, really hoping that uh, if you don't have any questions that you sleep well tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's one down the front. Yes. <laughs> a lot of people have got TVs in their room, but I, I just don't come to that, I think when you're going to bed, but I like to go and read maybe two or three pages of a book. Me too. Is that? Yes, I, I love to do that in actual fact, and I have some good old favourites that I keep rereading at bedtime. Um, because I love that, just having something where you, you just block out the rest of the world, 
you, you read a couple of pages. There's been many a time I've dropped the book on my head as I've clearly fallen asleep while reading. I think, you know, you don't necessarily want to read a real page turner at, um, you know, because you don't want to then for that to keep you awake all night, but a soft light in your bedroom um, that is more towards a red or yellow colour will mean that it's not affecting your sleep as much. And just reading like that, I think, is very, very helpful just to calm your mind and sort of empty it of sort of the day's worries. So I, that's a, something that I do very much to go to sleep, yeah. I can sit down at night time in bed and watch TV for hours, but pick up a book and read one paragraph and I'm fast asleep. Why? It's really about arousal levels. So watching TV, uh, and when I say arousal, I don't mean that you're going to suddenly do something exciting. What I mean is that your body is, you're activated, you're excited. So by watching TV, uh, very often there's that feeling of what's happening next to the exciting movie or, or engaged with what's going on. Whereas reading a story, you're using your eyes, you're fatiguing your eyes, and that helps them go to sleep. So it's, it's a completely different thing, and that's what we find with the phones, where people are like on Facebook or something, or, or answering emails or texts, and especially for young people, can be quite um, activating. And so they find themselves not able to go to sleep for hours because they're not doing something relaxing, they're doing something that's kind of waking them up. So not only is um, these, these activities got the light associated with them that can keep you awake, it's the psychological activation as well. So you're looking for things that are relaxing and winding you down rather than exciting you. Uh, just a question here from a gentleman about how daylight saving might affect your sleep. Yes, that's actually a very good question because people do find that it affects them um, and can affect them at both ends. So both when you um, uh, have light in the evening and when you change it to you know, back, you get rid of daylight saving. So we find that um, there are more accidents driving to work on the morning that we change daylight savings to um, when people have to get up earlier we find that's quite disrupting for people. And then, of course, anybody with a child finds that daylight savings is very, very annoying because their kids are like, well, it's daylight, can't I be playing? So it really does affect. And for us, where we don't have a huge change in light and dark cycles, it doesn't necessarily affect our mood too much. But if you go to Northern Europe, where they have very long, dark periods during winter, it can really dramatically affect their mood. And so things like bright light therapy are very important there to help people feel better and reduce depression. Um, so we really, really are tied into the Earth's light-dark cycle, and light really makes us feel good. If I, if I, if I can't want to adjust the time a half an hour and leave it somewhere like winter, so Not if you one hour change, change it a, a little bit hour. at a time, yes, and, and leave it. yes, yeah, and so that's a more gradual adjustment rather than the hour. It can be quite a shock. Um, so it's like being jet lagged. Um, so you're exactly right. If you change it gradually, that makes a bigger difference. I think the suggestion was, why don't we just change it half oh. an hour ah. and have that the whole? Year I don't know. Round. You need to talk to that to the business people. <laughs> Um, who make these decisions. Um, I like to snack a lot, so I just wondered, is it still okay to have a small snack before bed and like some chamomile tea or something? And if not, um, how soon would you recommend that we stop eating before we go to sleep? I think that if the snack is small and you're not finding that consuming that um, cup of water the, or the chamomile tea before bed is not affecting you and needing you're not waking up from it, then that's fine. I think one of the real take-home messages is to be confident with your own judgment around these things with your sleep. And so if you're finding that the chamomile tea, which obviously doesn't have any caffeine in it, really helps you and you enjoy that in the evening, then I would keep doing it until a time when you feel like it's um, affecting you. Um, and it, I would say that to, to everybody, that there's going to be different little things that you do, with some which are really helpful and that you might find that 
over time that changes. So it's really just going with the flow a little bit and making sure that what you do isn't affecting your sleep and then just changing your, adjusting your behaviours accordingly. So no, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a little snack um, before bed and a chamomile tea or a you know, cup of warm milk some people like to have, those sorts of things, yeah. Does a Kindle count as screen time? (laughs) I hope not, because that's what I use. (laughs) Um, So I I have a little, I have a little light, one of the ones with a little light that kind of comes around the top, so I can angle it away from my eyes. Um, And so I I find that, and and it doesn't necessarily affect my sleep. Sometimes, if I'm very anxious or stressed about something, I find it does. Um, and so it, it really is kind of adjusting uh, what works for you. Some tablets these days have got um, blockers, blue light blockers on it, and so it, it kind of emits a rosy glow, and that light is less likely to affect your sleep, or they might have a dim, dimming kind of function. So all of those things will help make it l- impact your sleep less. If we take into account a healthy, sensible eating, would you say insomnia uh, is diet related? I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. And if you were eating a you know, healthy diet and you weren't eating too close to bed, then no, I wouldn't think so. But there are probably things within the diet that could help you sleep. And, th- and certainly there are a number of studies that are trying to look at whether there are components within food that can help you sleep better. The jury's out at the moment. But one of the things we do, we're beginning to really understand is that food does, your timing of meals does affect your body clock. Um, And so it's best to keep the timing of meals to your normal daytime period. And if you have to be awake in the late evening or night, to eat less. So it's better to have your breakfast, lunch and dinner and to have them within the sort of daylight hours rather than eating very late. So we see that people that eat, you know, at 11 or 12 o'clock at night, have a pizza then or something, um, or shift workers who eat a lot through the night, that can affect their metabolism. Yeah. Does uh, green tea and Chinese tea have a high um, caffeine? um, Because I, I can't sleep when I have those yeah they do actually have caffeine so the darker color the black teas they do have caffeine less than coffee but they do have some and so if you're sensitive to it then yeah avoid them um, close to bedtime as well switch to a, a, a more white tea one that has less caffeine is it important to avoid naps during the day short naps during the day If you're finding that they're affecting your ability to go to sleep at night, I personally love a nap, um, but that's also because at the moment with two small children, I don't really get a lot of sleep at night. Um, And so when I can get, you know, a 20 minute or if, you know, half an hour nap in the afternoon, I take it. Um, I think they just, it, it, it has a wonderful feeling when you nap and they also obviously help if, uh, your alertness and that sort of thing. But if you're finding that they affect your, night, your ability to sleep at night, then I'd avoid them. And so it is a bit of an individual thing. Um, I have a 91-year-old father who, like me, is a professional insomniac. <laughs> um, we can both go all night without sleep and function normally and always have. Mm-hmm. But the last five years, probably since his middle 80s, he will not sleep in a bed. He only sleeps in a chair. Mm. So is this my future? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine he enjoys sleeping in the chair because it's um, perhaps uh, maybe a little bit painful to lie down or uncomfortable. Some people do prefer to switch over to a chair and, and it can be a little less restful sleep. But as you age, he's, he's probably getting just kind of, he's probably dozing uh, on and off. Yeah. And so the chair becomes the comfortable place to sort of sleep. So it's not necessarily uh, the future for you, you know. Make sure you have that really fabulous mattress and comfy bed that you'll want to return to. Um, But one thing, and and you really pointed it out, that both you and your father kind of almost naturally don't need as much sleep, that there is a genetic variance in the amount of... sleep people need. So some people need an awful lot and if they lose just one hour feel devastatingly affected and some can get along with sort of the the four or five hours a broken sleep and it'd be totally fine. 
Um, I think some of our politicians make out that they're the ones at the superhuman end and don't need much sleep. Um, but certainly it's, it's a, you know, a natural variant across all parts of life. So you'll definitely run into... There'll be some people in this room who really can function very well on small amounts of sleep and some people who need the sort of nine, ten hours, otherwise they feel terrible.